so my name is Josh Beal. I'm with the Beal team at Atoka Properties, and we help buyers and sellers navigate that entire process. So if you want a coach and a mentor to help you negotiate through, get the best possible deal, that's what we're here for. Okay, awesome. And do you specialize in any particular form of real estate? Like maybe... Yeah. Yeah. So we, we mostly do residential for people that are buying and selling residences. We do have some kind of a commercial wing, um, but uh, our niche really is resi residential. And we are located in Charlestown. We are five minutes from the Virginia state line, 10, 15 minutes from the Maryland state line. So we help in all of those, those jurisdictions. But uh, Charlestown is kind of the epicenter of where we, where we work. And it's, it's sort of our specialty, the Charlestown area. Very nice. And talk to me a little bit about your journey, about how you got into the real estate mm -hmm. industry. Yeah. So um, it was kind of a long and meandering route to where I am now. We, uh, my, when I say we, I mean my, my family and I in 2010, we bought something in, uh, in Charlestown. And this, it's kind of a wild story. So this is, this is the beginning of the, or I guess the end of that real estate bubble that we went yes. through. And we purchased an old fixer-upper property for 135,000, which is kind of an astonishing number with all the numbers we have now. Yes. But but it, w it was still, even then, it was kind of a good deal. And we, the prior owners had paid 735 for it. Mm -hmm. So um, that was kind of, and, and that was for us to live in. That wasn't an investment, but okay. we, we purchased it, we did a bunch of renovations, and then when we got out the other side of that, I realized, you know what, there's real opportunity to build wealth in real estate. We had an appraisal done as part of that whole process, and we saw that you know, we invested some money, and it had gone up significantly more in value than what we'd invested. And um, that kind of got me started. That was you know, 15 years ago, starting to think, well, what, what does it look like to have a business in real estate and to help other people be successful in real estate? And we tried a number of things. Um, rental property acquisition, land, buying and selling land, um, subdivisions, house flipping. And uh, along the way, I was buying and selling property and I thought, you know what, I really need to get into the brokerage side of things because I'm buying and selling significant amount. I really need to get my license and, and uh, you know, I'm already doing a lot of those things. Yeah. I can assist other people as well. Okay. And initially my thought was, this is primarily going to be just for friends, family. Um, but after I got licensed, the first year I got licensed, that was in 2017. I think I did seven or eight transactions that that year, mostly just for friends and family. And oh, I nice. thought, and I thought, you know what? I actually enjoy this more than I thought, and I'm I'm better at this than I thought. I think if I really studied this craft, I could be pretty good at this and really turn this into into something bigger. Yeah. So. Um, that was 2017. Fast forward to today, um, I'm the broker for Atoka Properties in West Virginia. So Atoka Properties and McInerney have, I think, 400 -ish agents throughout the D.C. metro area. Okay. And I kind of head up the West Virginia side of the business. Nice. Um, yeah. Cool. I love how you were just like, I'll just do this, help some friends and family. Like, wait a minute, I actually love this. Let me make a career out of this. Yes. That's great. I love how people stumble upon their journeys in that way by accident or like, they got laid off or they end up going some completely different route and then it leads to like yeah. their future careers. I think that's so great. <clears throat> and that's how you discover and learn more about yourself. And yeah. What you want to do. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, as far as marketing goes for your business, how are you guys marketing the services yeah. that you provide? So most of our business comes from uh, really low tech stuff. Um, we host events that we invite past clients to, people that are in our network, and we're constantly looking. We're constantly looking for opportunities and ways to reach out to and serve people that are in our sphere of influence, um, and and that's kind of just works. That's what's worked best for us. We have experimented with social media, you know, newspaper advertisements and so forth. We would love to find a better way to connect with new people yeah. that works. But at least for us, what we found working works is um, events, one-on-one uh, -on -one -on -one meetings. So like, for instance, this year we, we hosted, it's often just things that are just for fun. Yeah. I mean, we need to stay in relationship with past clients and with our sphere of influence, even when they don't need us necessarily professionally, but um, we need to keep that relationship going. So this year we have done uh, a roller skating party 
We've hosted three investor meetups for people that are you know, talking about real estate investing. Uh, we have another one coming up in October. We did an ice cream social. Um, we're going to have a, um, a pumpkin patch thing. So it's kind of a mixture of things that are, some of the things are just for fun. Some of them do have a kind of pro professional angle like, yes. Let's talk about the investing process, or what does it look like to build a new house? Education. Yeah, uh -huh. so we try and do a mixture of those things, and then just invite, we start by inviting our community, the people that we've worked with in the past, or that we know professionally, and, and then we invite them to invite people that they know. So, you know, we get introduced to new people. Yeah. So that's what's worked best for us. You got any advice for us? You're in the photography, you know, media business. Yeah. Um, if you are currently not in social media right now, like Instagram or YouTube, I definitely would delve into that, making video content, because that is yeah. currently very popular. I would do maybe mix it up with some humor, but also educational, if that's something that you want to do, because I know some people are not very, like, social media savvy, if you yeah. know. Um, but something that maybe you're passionate about, like maybe you like, let's see, mm, motorcycles. Maybe you mm -hmm. could be on a motorcycle riding and talking about like, hey, look at this house here. Blah, 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 blah. I don't know. Something that you want to add like maybe authenticity to it, mm -hmm. but also something that you like. So when you do it, it's something you enjoy and it's not so much of like an extra uh task for you to do yeah i would say that and the the number one thing that i hear other people talk about is um you just gotta start you gotta just hit record yeah. some people don't like how they sound or look i'm one of those people where i'm like oh i hate hearing my voice but now i'm used to it after hearing it so much i'm just like oh i don't care anymore but i was always like i sound like a chipmunk but that's fine <laughs> yeah um just getting over that even from my mm -hmm. personal experience just getting over that and yeah. Yeah, it's better to produce content and get better at it than, than not have uh, that, anything at yeah. all. And as you do it, you learn like what's working, what's not working, and what you like and don't. So yeah. that would be my advice. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. And that's that's good advice. It kind of reminds me, um, I forget who exactly I heard say this, but his advice was um, be strict about showing up and gracious about what you produce. Yes. Because absolutely. if you are strict about okay i'm going to do this once a week or whatever skill it is you're trying to get better at you know just you be consistent you got to yeah. keep at it that's Absolutely. right um, so um what do you what are your thoughts on social media like what do you currently do with that yep so we are on social media um i definitely think i should be more um maybe aggressive or consistent about producing videos um i um we do my goal is to do about one a week. Um, I kind of it just got so busy that for most of this year, we I, I really didn't produce one video a week. I um, would love to get better at video, so it's good good that I'm here having this experience. Um, and generally, what's what, the kind of videos that I've been doing are just really low key. Here's what's happening in the market. Here's you know local hey, new, local yeah local new construction stuff, um, etc. Uh, we don't have a fancy studio like this, so That's they're right. they're they're pretty simple, you know, uh, cell phone videos and okay. so forth. We also do infographics and things like that. Um, yeah, so just no, kind of great. basic, pretty basic stuff. But it does it does help get our name out there. I'm sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, where do you hope to see yourself and your business in the next five years? Yeah. So we. Um, would love to kind of move to the next level. So in terms of numbers for us, for the past three years, we've been kind of at about the same, doing about 60 transactions a year. Um, and then we've had, you know, each year there's been some kind of additional thing that we're doing and from an investment perspective, like we built two houses, we flipped one house in the last year, we've got a subdivision, which we're wrapping up right now. So where I see myself in, did you say five years? Yeah. So I'd like to be at about double the transaction volume, you know, so 100 to 130 ish uh, transactions. I think we've got the processes and systems in place to support that. Mm -hmm. And then I would love to be doing more on the new construction side, you know, it would it would be great if we had lots of options for clients that come to us. Well, we can help you. We can help you broker a deal with something that's on the market. We have, you know, five or six new construction homes that we can get you in uh, on early if if they look like a good fit for you. We have a couple of flips, renovation projects we're working on. I would love to have sort of that whole 
uh, sort of one stop shop you yes. know, um, opportunity for, yeah, for buyers. For everyone to go to yeah. right here. Yeah. That's mm-hmm. great. Yeah. Um, I have a question about what the difference would be. I mean, there's some obvious differences, but between buying a fixer upper and just buying a new home, can yeah. you? share what that would entail and maybe why one is better than the, than other, the other or maybe yeah. sure. vice versa. Well, for I would say that for people that are looking for the best value that want to um, spend, you know, minimize what they're spending in terms of in contrast to what they're getting, fixer-uppers are the way to go because you are competing with fewer people. So if you and we see this all the time with buyers. You know, you show up at a house, and if it's got problems, there's a whole, whole pool of buyers that are going to say, "I'm not interested in this in this house because of the headache that goes along with mm-hmm. it." So, that's going to reduce the demand, which is going to reduce the price. And if you, but if you're if you're one of those people that's willing to kind of have the vision to look past the problems then you're competing with fewer people. You're going to be able to get a better deal. But you also have to recognize you're, there's going to be some headache associated with that. So there are um, there's more cash that you're going to need because you're going to purchase the house and then you're going to have all these projects to do. Whereas if you, if you buy the house and it's ready, more or less ready to go, you know, you've got your down payment, you have your loan, and that's kind of all the cash that you're going to need to put out. Mm-hmm. One way or another, when you're buying a fixer-upper, there's going to be cash after the fact that you're going to have to put out. Mm-hmm. Now, there are some ways to wrap that into your loan. So there's what they call renovation financing, which is where, um, like, let's say, just, you know, to make the numbers easy, let's say you're looking at a house that's $400,000, and you're going to spend... Fifty thousand uh, dollars to get it where you want it to be. So your total project is four hundred fifty thousand dollars. So there are some lenders that will say, "Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to treat this like it's a four hundred fifty thousand dollar house, mm. and then w- you're going to make your down payment just like you would on a four hundred fifty thousand dollar house. So if it's ten percent down, you pay forty five thousand dollars, and then now you have two buckets of money. One is for the purchase." And the other is money that you can draw on for your renovation. Okay. So you don't have any extra cash out of pocket. It's kind of wrapped into your whole purchase. Yeah. So they call it renovation financing. Um, there's red tape associated with that. And by that, I mean that the lender wants to know, they're giving you this money to fix the house up, and they don't want you to go spend it on fireworks and candy. No. Uh, so they're gonna they're not going to give it to you all at once. They're going to say, okay, give us your plan. What are you going to do? They're going to look at it and scrutinize it and tell you if they're if they're okay with it yeah. and then they're going to give it to you a piece at a time they're going to say okay you need to do these things and then we're going to make sure you actually did them and then yes. we'll give you the next piece so i've actually i the house that i mentioned earlier yes. that's we did that and it took quite a long time to kind of work through all of that red tape um if i had known how difficult it was i don't know if i would have been excited as excited about it at the beginning yeah. Yeah. but at the end you know, I'm very pleased with how it worked out. You know, it was a lot of headache and running around and meeting with contractors and getting paperwork done. But um, if you're willing to, so I guess a summary is a fixer-upper is a great opportunity if you have the time to invest in it. And even if you're paying other people, there's going to be a significant amount of extra time mm-hmm. just managing all the work and the, kind of the time and the headache and, and mental space that's going to be required. Mm-hmm. So don't underestimate that. That would be my advice for buyers is if you think you want to fix her up or just make sure that your life is going to accommodate that. Um, yeah. I know we had, it happened during COVID. Uh, my parents-in-law, they had like some construction going on and it was just like a little thing in the kitchen and we had to replace like the oven or something some at some point. Yeah. And it was a bit crazy because it was like... Everything takes there longer. Was tarp and... We yeah. had to walk around the other way or way, and it, I'm sure, like, I can't imagine a fixer upper like, the time and patience you need. Like, yeah. okay, everybody, this side of the house is under construction. We're tr- going to try to move the microwave here. So, I don't know. Yeah. So, yeah, it looks exciting on HGTV. Um, of course, they get it done in, in 30 minutes with, yes. with time for commercial breaks, you know. Yes. Uh, so, in, uh, in real life, it, it always takes longer than you expect and costs, costs a little bit more than you expect. Yeah. I mean, you should really go in. You set your budget and you'd say, okay, I'm going to set aside at least another 10%. You know, for that $50,000 $50, hypothetical, make sure you got 55. And uh, hopefully you don't have to spend it. Probably you will. Yeah, most likely. <laughs> Probably yeah. you will. 
because uh, oh. something will come up. Yeah. Okay. And um, when you're not delving into the real estate world, like putting things out on social mm -hmm. media and yeah. helping clients, what do you like to do to unwind and relax? Sure. Well, um, I got six kids, so they take up a significant amount of time. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's a party at our house all the Love time. Um, and the oldest is 17, the youngest is 10, oh. so we kind of got a wide range. The oldest, the oldest is 17, you know, college is just around the corner. She's in her senior year this year. Uh, she's actually started to take a few college classes, a dual enrollment thing. So um, the stuff that I'm trying to do to unwind and have fun as I'm thinking about Wow, I've got a kid that's going to be leaving soon. Is I, I better make sure I'm investing in these kids' lives, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And uh, you know, I want them to kind of be launched in the world and and have good memories of you know time at home with dad. So, um, I'm trying to trying to figure out things to do with the kids that they enjoy. Um, some of them, everybody's got different interests. This summer, we've got plans to take everybody snowboarding. I took one. I took my son Peter snowboarding. And he really enjoyed it. And we're in the process over the summer of accumulating lots of used, inexpensive snowboarding equipment. I got five. In the last two weeks, I picked up five snowboards um, off Facebook Marketplace. You are going to be so ready when the time comes. <laughs> yeah, that's I love right. that. Oh my God. Is um, everybody down for the snowboarding? Is someone yeah. like nervous? Like, I'm no, gonna ev skiing. everybody wants to do it. So, on deck. yeah. And it. actually, we so we actually already went out and bought. Um, if, if at the be end of the prior season you buy lift tickets for the upcoming season, they'll give you the best possible deal. Okay. So we got a bunch of lift tickets, you know, without days selected. They're just prepaid. So yeah. we've got that. I love to travel. You know, I, I love just going places. Um, so anytime I can take one, of the, take one of the kids and say, hey, let's go. Let's go to this place, even if it's just a day trip or an afternoon yeah. trip. You know, I, I, I enjoy that. So. Um, what are some places that you guys have gone that you're like, wow, this is awesome? Yeah, so um, this is two years ago now that we took – actually, it was three years ago. Man, time flies. <laughs> um, three years ago, as a family, we took a round-the-country round the road trip. It was wow, – yeah, 6,400 miles, 6,000 6, and some change. Maybe it was 6,200 miles. And uh, – Grand Canyon, um, the Badlands, um, and Colorado. Um, that, so probably my favorite in that that particular trip, we went to Estes Park, which is in the Colorado Rockies, and um, that that was really cool. We stayed in just a cabin that somebody had, and we were able to hike up into the Rockies. Um, cool. And there was a there was this really beautiful lake at the top of uh, that particular hike, you know, mountaintop lake. And that that was kind of fun. And you go from the other thing that was wild about that. This is the middle of the summer. Oh, I'm sure it was hot. Yeah, it was hot at the base of the mountain, and then as you go up and up and up, it starts to get colder, and then there's snow, and you're like, "What, what is going on?" Did I just experience the whole season? On <laughs> that, a couple that's hours? right. Yeah, that's, that's right. Wild. Yeah. Were you guys a lot on like the open roads, like in the movie? Every time I'm like the open road when you go yes. cross country yep. road trip. Yeah, we had a lot of open road. Um, actually, so we were driving a Suburban, pulling a little trailer with all the, you know, we're all packed into the vehicle, and then we got a little box trailer with all the, everybody got a, a bin, you know, like yeah. one of those Rubbermaid yeah. bins. It's like, okay, if <laughs> you can fit, ones. that's the big ones, right. It's like, okay, kids, whatever you can fit in this bin, that's what you're going to have for the next three weeks. <laughs> so everybody gets a bin. Um yeah, and we were on the open road, and yeah. Anyway, that was a really fun experience. I'd love to be able to do it again. It was it was tough to get away for three weeks. Uh, I am oh, blessed. Three weeks. Nice. Yeah. So it, I am I am um, grateful for the team that I work with. That um, while I was away, they were able to handle things on the ground. And then basically, what would happen is we were stopping every night somewhere, and I could debrief with the team. And if there's anything I needed, like a call I needed to hop onto with a client or something like that. Um, so maybe Sunday we'll be able to do that again. That was a pretty big undertaking. And um, maybe maybe next time it won't be three full weeks, but, you know, we could, hey, we could drive out somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. Make it happen somehow. Yeah. Um, talk to me about your team. How many people do you work yeah. with and what's the work mm -hmm. um, environment like? Yeah. So um, I work very closely with another agent, Jess Durr, um, and she and I work full time in real estate, you know, this is how we put food on the table. And um, we also have um, a number of other kind of part-time and contract people. We have a transaction coordinator who helps us with all the admin stuff associated with our files. Uh, we do have an intern right now 
who is thinking about, um, he's a young guy just out of, just out of high school, and he's, he's kind of exploring different career options, and real estate's one of the possibilities. So he helps us with, uh, well, he's, he's learning and kind of shadowing us on all the negotiation and paperwork and logistics type stuff. And, um, and then we'll also bring him to some of the just, sometimes there's, there's stuff that's like, oh, that's kind of gross, but we got to do that. You know, we're going to clean this house out. We had one listing where we had guano, bat guano in the attic What's and bat poop, bad poop. Guano is, guano is what they call um, bird and bat feces. feces. So, okay. mm-hmm. yeah, it's got its own name. Yeah. I did not know that. I just yeah. Didn't mean, is that what? That's of... that's a good question. That's a good <laughs> that's question. Okay for my yeah, I think guano. is it yeah is it spelled the same? It I might have be no G U A N O is how you spell guano. But uh, anyway, hey, didn't know I'd be talking about that on the spot. Yeah, we'll talk about everything on this yeah, podcast. That's right. So anyway, we've anytime there's something like that, I'll, I'll say, hey Carter, help me. We got to move these logs or we got to um, clean this thing up. And that was probably the worst. But he was a good sport about it. He was oh. like, okay, this is what we're doing. You know, let's, do it. let's, <laughs> get, it let's get it cleaned out. That's how you learn, right? Yeah. Once you get through this, the rest hopefully yeah. will be yeah. <laughs> maybe. Yeah. I know with real estate, it's different every time. So even if you mm-hmm. get used to a certain way, it could change. Yeah. Um, talk to me. So, and we have one more. I don't want to, if she oh, hears no, this, please. I don't want her to feel left out. I'm so um, sorry. That was my fault. Please. <laughs> yeah. um, and then we have an agent, um, an agent who is our showing assistant. So she can help us. Often there's just so much going on. We've got a buyer that's interested in getting into something. It can be time sensitive. So we brought on a showing assistant that if we need help getting into a property where, where Jess and I are busy, um, we can still make it happen with whatever schedules we've got going on. So it's myself and Jess and then three others uh, that are you know, kind of part time. And I would love it. I mean, if we hit 120 transactions, we're definitely going to have to grow a little bit. Mm-hmm. But it's important to us to figure out what is the what's the right way to scale so that everybody is um, being utilized correctly. Yes. Uh, in other words, what are you good at? Let's make sure you can do, you can focus on that yes. um, and, and not just grow just because, well, we're kind of feeling busy and we want to add some bodies. Yeah. You know, make sure we add the right people in the right roles. I like that. yeah, so, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, what are some good characteristics that you think a real estate agent should have? Yeah, I know it's different for everyone, but I want to know your personal take. Sure. So I think you need um, to be a gracious, thoughtful person, um, which maybe is a little bit different than I don't know if other people would say the same thing. But uh, in my opinion, a good real estate agent really is a coach. It, it was a couple a couple things is a negotiator, advocate for their client and also a coach about what the whole process looks like and in order to be a good coach in my opinion you need, you need to be a good listener and you need to understand what your client um, is looking for and you got to be you got to be thoughtful about that so you don't want to be a type a personality that just kind of has a process and you're just railroading the client through that you need to be listening you need to be looking for what your client is saying, I guess you're, you're listening, not looking. Um, although some of that body language will yes, tell you a lot. That's right. You need to be listening to what your client is saying and understanding what their, what their goals are. And sometimes, so what I found is people, let's take buyers for example, mm-hmm. they don't necessarily articulate or even recognize themselves exactly what it is that that is the solution. And here's what I mean by that. So um, they're naturally going to tell you things like, well, I'd like a house of this size, and I'd like a yard of this size, and this many square footage, and this kind of area. Um, But as you start to talk to them, you may discover that there's other things that are important to them related to, you know, whether it's location or or, um, maybe amenities that are nearby. Sometimes there are other things like that that they don't actually surface automatically, but as you start to ask questions, they'll say, oh, um, I really need to be close to you know, a pool or something like that, or there needs to be a dog park or something like that. <laughs> yeah. And so you need to ask kind of those probing questions and, um, and just listen and, and keep those things in mind as you're helping them to search. So. And I like that you also said, like, not just listen, but look, because body language is very important. Because I yep. could be saying yes, but maybe I'm like, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. 
you know so I think that's really important to also look out for those key factors of like how a person is like the tone of their voice yeah their gesture all that so I think that's great that you take that into consideration so, yeah um and while I have you here have I touched on everything that maybe you'd like to share with the audience is there something maybe that I have not touched on that you would like to highlight yeah so um I think when you are interviewing a real estate agent, you should make sure that you are a good fit for them and they are a good fit for you. There needs to be, you need to be able to trust your agent. I think trust is really important in any kind of a professional relationship, but um, the clients that we have been able to win the biggest for are the ones that we have a high level of trust with both ways. You know, we trust them and they trust us. Mm -hmm. um, so if you feel like some people are, you know, trust needs to be built for sure. And that's true with everybody, not just some people. Yes. But um, we definitely have had circumstances where um, maybe the clients are feeling a little bit more nervous. And if they don't share with us and aren't willing to kind of go a little bit deeper with, yeah. with what it is that they're looking for, sometimes we, we find that we aren't able to negotiate for them as effectively because we don't quite know what they want and we don't quite know what um, what's best for them. Yeah. So that would be... I guess that would be something I would share is build a relationship with your agent, whoever that is, and make sure it's someone they can, that you can trust yes. and then, and that they trust you. And, um, that's how you're going to have the most successful relationship with a broker that's trying to advocate for you. Yeah. All right. My final question now is, do you have maybe a mantra that you like to live your life by or that inspires you? And if you do, could you share that with the audience? Yes. So, um, our, um, we, we actually got t-shirts for our family, um, that say <laughs> that, that, that have kind of a, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if mantra is the right word, but Motto. yeah. So, and they say, have courage, um, be kind and love others. So, you know, I think and that's, that's a mantra. yeah. You tell yourself yeah. that, look in the mirror and try to live by that. I think that's a good yeah. one. Yep. And the fact that you have t-shirts for that with your family, yeah. that is so cute. I think you should post the picture of you all wearing it yeah. on your story or something. That would be cute. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast and taking time out of your day to be here. We really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. Glad to be here. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the opportunity. Absolutely.